The Denver Broncos' official depth chart is out ahead of Sunday's match against the New York Giants. Plus, it is crossover Thursday, which means that Sarah and myself, we sit down with Patricia Train, a host of Locked on Giants, to talk about the storylines to watch and the key matchups on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome back into a brand new episode, Lockdown Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast here on the Lockdown NFL Network, your team every day from the South Stands to the end zone. I'm your host, as always, Cody Rourke, joined alongside co-host Sarah Bettinger. Both of us, we cover the Denver Broncos for the Lockdown NFL Network and Nine News. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and make sure you follow and subscribe to Lockdown Broncos on your favorite podcast provider, not to mention YouTube. We are available free and everywhere. Sarah, my friend, the depth chart is out. The Broncos making some moves, losing some guys off the practice squad, gaining guys on the practice squad. And we have a little bit of an update about Bradley Chubb, man. How you doing? Doing great, Cody. Doing great. We're one day closer to the start of the NFL season, one day closer to Broncos game day. I am, you know, I'm just, I'm pumped. I mean, this is the best time of year for me. So I can't wait to watch tomorrow night's game. I can't wait to watch, you know, all the other games. I can't wait to watch college football. This is just, this is the best, man. We finally get to talk about some real things that are happening. I feel like I've spent the last nine months just talking about like, (laughs) You know, going like beautiful mind style, like what could happen if this, what could happen if that? And now here we are, we finally get to talk about real stuff. It's great. I know. It's my favorite thing to do. Obviously, week one, just the excitement, I think, for every NFL fan base. I I know Broncos country specifically, they're excited. They've let us know that in the comment section, how excited they are for kickoff. A lot of high expectations for this Broncos team. Now, yesterday, some news. The Broncos lost Mac McCain the third off the practice squad to the Philadelphia Eagles. But in return, they've gained Savion Smith. He is back on the Broncos practice squad, fulfilling that 16th spot here. I'm not mad at it. Look, you lose a corner, you gain another guy. I like it. I was surprised Smith wasn't brought on sooner. But it maybe says that they viewed a little bit more about Mac McCain, who Vic Fangio had made mention of this offseason quite a bit, alongside Nate Harrison. Uh, any thoughts on that? Because I know that you were talking about it on social media yesterday about you know a guy like Mac McCain being poached off the practice squad, but a guy like Cam Fleming is on the 53. Help it make sense. Right, Cody. I mean, to me, and I'm going to gripe about this, I think, for a while. And I'm not going to be I'm not going to be a jerk about it or anything. Look, it's one out of 53 spots. Right. But at the same time, like we love like we've mentioned before, we love talking about every single player on the roster, whether it's, you know, Cortland Sutton, Von Miller at the top one, two or players number 89 and 90 throughout the entire offseason. So when you cut it down to 53 guys after other players have had opportunities to really prove themselves, to really earn their spots, or maybe you see guys show flashes, or maybe you see something from their college tape that you really like, it's really difficult in my mind to justify, okay, with the with the new rules the NFL has put into place about you know veterans being allowed on the practice squad, I don't think there was anything that Cam Fleming put on tape in the preseason that you could actually realistically say, oh yeah, there's some some team is going to come and poach him, especially because you have the opportunity to put a protection on guys like that. So if you really were worried about that, I mean, the Broncos at this point, now you've lost, you've lost Mac McCain. You lost a guy that you, I know, like Cody Trey Marshall to the Los Angeles Chargers, a guy who could probably help this week on special teams. You've yeah. lost Adam Prentice to the New Orleans Saints. You've sacrificed three young players, in my opinion, to be able to keep Cam Fleming on the active roster at this point. I disagree with that decision. I don't I know it's just splitting hairs. It's one out of 53, but at the same time it's turned into three potentially out of 53. So three guys that I think could really help, you know, not just this year but over the course of the long haul. So I'm not a huge fan of of losing Mac McCain. I think great opportunity for him with the Eagles. I don't blame him for taking that opportunity instead of you know saying no no I'm gonna stick with a with the Broncos practice squad here don't blame him for that but also like you mentioned Cody love the move to bring back Savion Smith made probably the most splashy special teams play of the preseason in my opinion with the big hit and then also too I think you know our good friend Mario tweeted at me and saying that a lot of the Broncos players were surprised that that Smith wasn't kept on the active roster much less not brought back to the practice squad so I think that there's a chance we could see him suiting up sometime soon 
Yeah, well, I'm excited to see the Broncos obviously designated their four practice squad spots already. Demaria Crockett, Brett Rippon, Tyree Cleveland, three of those guys that they have protected on this week. But, you know, Sarah, let's get to our other talk boy here. Bradley Chubb, obviously, you know, let's let's address it quick and move on from it because I know a lot of Broncos country was freaking out yesterday when Bradley Chubb was detained for not, you know, failing to appear at a court thing. Here's the deal, folks. It, it, it's not like he went out there and committed a felony-based crime. Look, it, so many people have done that. There are a lot of people, and Vic Fangio, mentioned his press conference Bradley's an upstanding guy it's not nothing that they're worried about it's over it's done with let's not make a mountain out of a molehill here but the message is like if you got something to take care of just take care of it I mean it's plain and simple just take care of it get it done you don't have to worry about it after you pay it or whatever you do or, or appearing so uh some some wisdom there you know learn from his mistake there but let's get to the depth chart here the Broncos right. announced their official depth chart there Sarah offensively really no surprises you have Teddy Bridgewater you have Melvin Gordon Cortland Sutton Tim Patrick Jerry Judy Noah Fant we know the offensive line Garrett Bowles Dalton Reisner Lloyd Cushenberry Graham Glasgow and Bobby Massey at right tackle no surprise at all on the offensive side of the ball not even at the backups pretty much what we had expected and what we had even projected in our depth chart piece that we did a couple weeks back defensively any surprises to you because I feel like it was also on the same accord of kind of what we were thinking on the base package, you have Ronald Darby and Kyle Fuller, but I think we're going to see that to start the game, and then we're going to transition a lot to the nickel, I think, is what we're going to see from the Broncos' defense as the game goes on. I think you're spot on, Co Cody. It was really chalk for me on both sides of the ball. You know, I think from what we kind of predicted, like you said, and and not that, you know, we're some Nostradamus or something for predicting the depth chart. I think it was pretty set in stone, pretty clear, um, especially after, you know, Vic Fangio said Massey was the guy that was, you know, the, the one to beat at right tackle. So, of course, he held held that position down over the course of the last couple of weeks, whether it was the final preseason game or practice. And so no surprises offensively or defensively for me and I think too what's really great about this whole depth chart Cody is that the Broncos are like you said they're going to be able to rotate guys in and out you know this is like this is like in in the NBA when your your favorite player or one of your favorite players gets put on the bench you know the starting lineup is like why is that guy in the starting lineup over one of my favorite players well you, you rotate guys in and out so often that it really doesn't matter if you start the game. And I think that's the case with a number of positions for the Denver Broncos, namely wide receiver, uh, running back, uh, cornerback, you know, off the edge. I don't, I, I think that the backups even there, you could inter, interchange some guys there. I think we'll see a lot of their, their backup edge defenders in this game, regardless if, if Chubb is able to give it a go or not, I think he'll be limited one way or another. So I think it's, it's, it's definitely chalk for me, uh, as far as the depth, depth chart goes, no real surprises will be interesting to see though, after this first game, Cody, how does that depth chart translate to like what they're planning actually for this rotation, right? I mean, how how are they actually going to incorporate, you know, players like uh, Shamar Stephan or, or, you know, Deshaun Williams, Baron Browning? How often are those guys going to actually get in the game? Yeah, I think that'll be a big question. I can't wait to see the snap counts on Sunday. And obviously, we'll get that Monday after the game. We'll, we'll get the total number there. But looking at all the different options, the depth stands out to me clear as day. Offense, defense, it's a good thing to have right now week one, right? But it could completely change in the course of one week. So knock on wood, fingers crossed that the Broncos and the Giants can stay healthy this upcoming Sunday. But Broncos country coming up here in just a moment. Sarah and I, we're going to get into a conversation with Patricia Traina, host of the Locked on Giants podcast, as we get into crossover Thursday, our preview, our storylines to watch between the Broncos, the Giants. We're going to hear from Patricia on her side as to what's going on with the Giants. She's going to hear about the Broncos side from us. And then we're going to flip it. We're going to talk about key matchups that we're each looking forward to on Sunday. But before we do that, let me tell you about the sponsor of today's episode of the show. It's good friends over there at Manscaped. And attention gamblers of all shapes and sizes, our friends at Manscaped have a can't-miss bet for you today. The leaders in Mel Grumman just launched their fourth-generation performance package, and the betting odds are in your favor when you use the Lawn Mower 4.0. Across the board, this is the package to get you in the mood for whatever your gambling heart desires. Ready to take the leap to make grooming royalty? Two million men have already joined. Join Manscaped movement by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on the performance package 4.0 by manscaped is the ultimate parlay to take your grooming game to the next level the fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology it also gives you the ability to turn on the 400k led spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave plus it's waterproof and i want you to check it out today you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com that's 20% off 
off plus free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. Fellas, don't gamble on shaving your balls with the wrong tools. Choose Manscaped and your balls will thank you. <laughs> Crossover Thursday all across the Locked On NFL Network as football season is finally here, week one. I'm Cody Rourke, and this is Sarah Bedger. We're joined by Patricia Trainer, and also we're joining Patricia Trainer's Locked On Giants show to talk about Sunday's match between the Denver Broncos and the New York Giants. We're going to flip the script here a little bit here. And Patricia, obviously great to see you. I know we spoke briefly during this offseason once the schedule was announced and we found out these two teams were playing. Uh, But let's waste no time here. The New York Giants, they're a team that I've kept my eye on this offseason because I felt like last year they were an underrated defensive team. They didn't get the recognition I felt like that they had deserved and they had some tough players there. Looking at some storylines to watch here, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't open up here by asking you from a Broncos perspective, what is the latest status on Saquon Barkley coming off of ACL surgery? To our knowledge, he had just recently come back into contact practice for the first time this offseason. Where are things at with Saquon? Yeah, first off, good to see you both. Um, Saquon Barkley went through a padded practice last week. It was actually, uh, I'm sorry, a partially padded practice last week. I think it was shorts and shells. Um, had some contact. Today, Wednesday, um, when we record this, he went through a fully padded practice. And so he got the contact. They simulated the contact. Now, as you guys know, in practice, it is a controlled environment. It's not the same as, you know, you're out there on the field and you have somebody coming at you 100 miles a minute and boom, he pops you. That said, it was very encouraged to see uh, they were very encouraged by what Saquon was able to do. Um, Joe Judge, we spoke to him before practice, and he said the key for Saquon is going to be these three days coming up, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. How is he going to respond to the increased workload? And this is right now he's at a max as far as his workloads goes. So this is as much as they can put on him as is, I guess, allowed by uh, the CBA. So they are going to see how he responds after Um, Wednesday, after Thursday, after Friday, and then they are going to make a decision on him. If I had to take a guess, I think we do see him. I think he will be on a pitch count, all right? Um, I know the Giants have a short work week afterwards, so the question came up, well, does it make more sense to hold Barkley till next week? And Joe Judge was like, no, if he's ready to play, he's ready to play, and we'll just, you know, it's like any other player. We'll deal with it. If there's a workload management we have to adjust, we'll do it that way. But Barkley, I think it's going to be out there on a pitch count in limited fashion. You know, as after the preseason, you know, getting the chance to go up against a second string running back, that might validate a lot of fans' opinions about certain players in Denver. But uh, I'm, I'm an NFL draft person, Patricia. I love, I love prospects. I love watching new guys come in, get their feet wet. Personally, for me, I had Aziz Ojolari highly, more highly rated than Kadarius Tony going into the draft. So I felt like the Giants did a great job. I know Ojolari came in with some injury issues. What's the latest on him? How's he progressing? How's he looked in the preseason? Uh, what can we expect from him in game one? Well, you're not alone there. I also had Ojolari in the first round, and I had Tony actually in the second round. So we share that opinion in common. Ojolari has been um, probably the most active, the most productive of the Giants rookie draft class, which, you know, I know is not saying a lot given the injury statuses of the other guys. You know, we've got Tony who's been dealing with COVID and Aaron Robinson, the third round pick who's who's uh, currently on the pop list and Ellerson Smith who's on IR. But Ojulari, this is a kid who went up often against the first stringers And he was pretty darn good. Now, that said, the first stringers consisted of Andrew Thomas, Matt Paert, two guys that had struggles in the uh, the preseason. I think we all saw that in the preseason game, the preseason finale. But there's a lot of encouragement there because this is a kid who can hold the edge. He's a guy who can rush the passer. And he's only going to get better. And I think, you know, even though he's not listed as the starting defensive uh, edge rusher there, uh, O'Shea and Ziminez is ahead of him. I think and it's just a matter of time before he and Lorenzo Carter are your starting edge rushers. And I'm really excited to see what this kid can bring because he's got a quick first step. If he's healthy, I think he's going to be very disruptive and he's going to give offensive tackles a lot of problems. 
One of the key matchups I'm looking forward to seeing, obviously you look at the the wide receiving talent that they have there. Uh, you know, you mentioned Kadarius Tony. For the most part, I know there's been some question marks. Really, I think the biggest question mark entering this week is relative to Evan Ingram as he's dealing with an injury. Are there any inklings that he's going to play in this game? Because the last time Evan Ingram faced the Broncos, I remember it was a Sunday night football matchup in Denver. He absolutely torched the Broncos defense. You always have to watch out for him because of his versatility to line up pretty much anywhere in Joe Judge's offense. Uh, what's the latest on Evan Ingram? Because he's one of the key players I want to watch in this matchup. Right now, if I had to put money down, I would say you probably will not see Evan on Sunday. Evan worked on the side Wednesday with trainers. Um, I go back to when he was initially injured in the preseason finale, how he limped off the field, was on the bench. He had his head in his hands like, you know, he just lost his best friend. And when they took him off the field, back to the locker room, he didn't even get into the tunnel before we, you know, the call came up to the press box saying that he was out for the rest of the game. So that right there told me that that injury was significant. And it's really a shame because last year, Evan Ingram made it through his first full season last year, had some issues with drops and with some of, uh, of what they were asking him to do, but they had changed that up this summer. And with Kyle Rudolph on board, even though Kyle Rudolph didn't practice during training camp because he was, he spent most of it on pup. They changed up some of what they were asking Evan Ingram to do. And I was really looking forward to seeing what he brought in this kind of revised role, if you will. And I just don't think, you know, he's going to be out there. I think the Giants are going to be a little thin there at tight end. Kyle Rudolph, as I mentioned, just came off pup about three weeks ago. Caden Smith, the other tight end, he didn't practice Monday. Now, I think he was limited on Wednesday. We haven't gotten the official injury report as we record this, but I think he was limited. They're going to have to call somebody up, I think, from their practice squad. They got three tight ends on their practice squad. Somebody's getting a call up. I'm pretty sure of that. Well, it'll be interesting to see in this game whether or not Evan Ingram plays. I know from our perspective, we're excited to see potentially Patrick Sertan match up against him, but flipping it you know, around skill position on, on your defensive backs there in New York, for my money, this is best on best in this game. Broncos wide receivers versus Giants defensive backs. So give us kind of your your input on, on that matchup, looking ahead to going up against guys like Jerry Judy, who seems to have a viral video every week with his route running skills. And then Cortland Sutton, obviously with a big game back, his first game back from injury, KJ Handler, big time speed. Uh, Tim Patrick, obviously last season, kind of the breakout player going up against that Giants secondary. Right. I am a little concerned about Adoree Jackson. The Giants picked him up off of free agency once he was let go by the Tennessee Titans. He's been dealing with an ankle injury, but one of the reasons why they brought him in, as well as you know some other guys they brought in who unfortunately they won't have available because of injuries, was they wanted to play more man coverage. They wanted to get more physical, and I think that was the problem with the Giants last year. They weren't as physical with some of these guys coming off the uh, the line of scrimmage. They were allowing them free releases, and they were getting you know torched. Now, James Bradbury had a great year last year. He made the Pro Bowl, and he played up to that. So I'm not worried about him. I am concerned about uh, Jackson's uh, ankle, how well he's going to be for that game. I'm also concerned about Darnay Holmes in the slot and how well he keeps up with the speedsters that the Broncos had. Darnay Holmes last year, not horrible, but you know he's I think five foot ten. Um, takes a few gambles that you really sit there, you wish, and you say, God, I wish he hadn't done that. So he makes me just a little bit nervous. Um, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little concerned about that matchup, the Bronco receivers versus the Giants defensive backs. I think if Jackson is healthy, then um, then I think that's going to make a big difference because they can cover up the issues in the slot. They can bring down Xavier McKinney or Logan Ryan or, you know, one of those bigger body defensive backs to play in the slot if they need to, to get the best matchups. But uh, right now I'm a little, you know, if I had to pick which side would win that game, I think I would have to give the nod over to the Bronco receivers. Well, it's going to be an interesting matchup to watch. I know I got my James Bradbury lining up a quarter. So I think that's going to be a fun matchup. I, I think for if you're a Broncos fan or a Giants fan, that's one you're really looking forward to. But, you know, coming up here in just a moment, we're going to flip the script. Patricia's got a bunch of questions she's going to ask both Sarah and myself on the Bronco side as it pertains to storylines and also key matchups. We'll get to that coming up here in just a moment. But before we do that, let me tell you about the two sponsors of today's Crossover Thursday episode between Locked On Giants, Locked Lockdown Broncos, that's a good friends of their betonline.ag and rockauto.com. Now with BetOnline, football season is here. The Giants, Broncos, week one action, 2.25 p.m. 
Mountain Time kickoff at you know at MetLife Stadium here, and BetOnline has all the action for you there, where you can get all the updated odds, props, and contest information today. And you can get into the action too with the NFL's online half million dollar mega contest, not to mention the two hundred thousand dollar NFL Survivor contest, which is open now. BetOnline.ag. You can head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your one hundred percent welcome bonus. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. And our good friends over there, rockauto.com. If you need anything for your vehicle, rockauto.com has everything. They're a family-owned business that's been serving auto parts customers online for over 20 years at rockauto.com. The prices are always reliably low, whether you're a professional or a do-it-yourselfer. And the one thing I like about rockauto.com is their catalog is unique and remarkably easy to navigate. You can quickly see all the parts available for your car or truck based on year, make, model, and even the brands, specifications, and the prices that you prefer. And that is all over there, rockauto.com. Why spend up to 50%, 30%, or even 100% more at other parts when you can go to rockauto.com today. And I want you to go check out rockauto.com to see all the parts available for your car or truck and write Lockdown Broncos or Lockdown Giants in your How Did You Hear About Us box so that they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Patricia, the floor is all yours. I know there's a lot of storylines that Giants fans are particularly interested in with this Denver Broncos team, so I'll let you ask our questions here today. All right. Thank you so much, guys. And again, great to chat with you. We got to start off with the quarterback situation. I think everybody was following that all summer long. Teddy Bridgewater versus Drew Locke. So two-parter for you. A, were you surprised that it was Teddy? And B, what does Teddy bring to this offense that maybe Drew didn't? You know, I can say I wanted Teddy Bridgewater to win all along, Patricia. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it was it was tough. It was It's tough for a lot of Broncos fans, I think, to see Drew Locke as the incumbent, as the 2019 second-round pick, somebody that a lot of fans, like myself, really bought into You know his, his potential. And I think that there's a lot of valid reasons to do that. Um, just based on his pure talent, his athleticism, just arm strength, the things that he did early on in the preseason against the Minnesota Vikings specifically. So to see Teddy Bridgewater win the competition after two preseason games, I would say it was a little bit surprising um, just from the standpoint that, you know, what, what we had been hearing from practices and what we had seen, you know, going out there and watching a couple practices was definitely an even even battle. And Vic Fangio talked about that. So it had to have come down to, I think, near the end when they had those joint practices with the Minnesota Vikings, seeing what Teddy was able to do against the Vikings' top defense. Vic Fangio even noted that was part of it. And so what I think he brings to the table, obviously something the Denver Broncos haven't had a lot of in recent years, which is accuracy on a consistent basis at the quarterback position. You know, with young quarterbacks, you're willing to take some lumps. You're willing to take some iffy performances if you can get those stretches of, of nice play, as I'm sure you understand with, with Daniel Jones as well. But with Teddy Bridgewater, what you're getting is a pretty consistently accurate guy, if overly conservative at times. And I think with this coaching staff, their jobs kind of being on the line, I think that you add a 67, 68% completion percentage guy into the starting lineup at the quarterback position, you believe you've got a top five defense potentially to back him up. That's a pretty, pretty uh, solid winning formula, I'd say. So I think that's kind of what went into it. And that's kind of what we're you know, being led to believe is where, why they went that direction. Now I know when um, he, he was with the Minnesota Vikings, Pat Shermer was there as well as their offensive coordinator, but I think Teddy was injured at the time or for most of that time. That said, how much do you think that factored into the equation? You know, Shermer's knowledge of Teddy and what he could potentially do for the offense that he's running. Uh, you know, I think a lot of it goes to familiarity, Patricia, you know, a safe option, you know, because there's a lot of pressure on Pat Shermer. The Broncos offense, the, they gambled after the 2019 season by firing Rich Scangerello, who's of the Kyle Shanahan coaching tree, obviously spent some time in Philadelphia, didn't last long there. But, you know, for a guy like Shermer, he was brought in to turn this offense around and, you know, a, a very experienced coach alongside quarterback coach Mike Shula. And obviously, you know a little bit more about Pat Shermer and Mike Shula as having time with the New York Giants organization there. But for the most part, looking at this offense, Teddy Bridgewater brings that consistent nature, a, a safe option. But an option, too, when you look at probably isn't going to turn the ball over as much as Drew Locke did. Now, how often will Teddy Bridgewater put the ball downfield and maybe test that? I mean, it remains to be seen here. I know that the Giants pose a really tough task in making that happen. But I think for Pat Shermer, knowing his experience, being around Teddy, understanding he's got these leadership traits to him, 
He can command the offense, which, you know, it is said to be a little bit of a complicated offense. And the Broncos are getting to a point now where they're trying to add a lot more. So I think putting that pressure on Teddy Bridgewater, Pat Shermer has the confidence to know that he can probably handle that. Now, you guys have some injuries on both sides of the ball. Noah Font, I guess we're waiting to find out what his status is going to be. Uh, Bradley Chubb, I guess, is dealing with an injury. What can you tell us about the injured guys, especially these these big names and you know these key players? Do you think they'll be available for Sunday? I think right now it's definitely trending for for Noah Fant to, to be playing. Uh, that seems the way that it's going. I think they kind of intentionally, deliberately kept him off the practice field the past couple weeks to sort of ramp up towards this. Bradley Chubb, it sounds like as of recording on Wednesday afternoon, it sounds like he's kind of trending more towards a – you know, slightly less than questionable uh, status for the game. So you kind of heard Vic Fangio talk at practice today about the fact that, hey, you know, we believe in Malik Reed, who's Bradley Chubb's primary backup. Um, at, we, we know we can lean on him. And then obviously the Broncos have a couple of other guys who showed well in the preseason off the edge to rotate in. But as of right now, seems like Fant is going to play. They they also talked up Albert Okawebunam as well, though. I mean, so they, they know, they realize that, like you said with Saquon Barkley, there's potential for either of those guys if both play or if only one there's potential that both could be on the you know the quote unquote pitch count for this game to see you know if they get limited reps or not but definitely trending more you know more towards fan playing and and less for Bradley Chubb and of course Bradley Chubb had that uh I guess he was detained I think I had seen there was a report that he ran into some legal issues or something like that yeah so nothing guess- too big just uh you know failure to appear and we we even said it in today's show as well you know if you have you know speeding tickets just pay them and yeah. you know, obviously you make your appearance it, it's something little but to note at the time when that when his court day was the Broncos were actually in Minnesota for joint training camp practices but you have to coordinate that and I think that there was a failure to communicate on that so Nothing that's not going to hold them out of action. What about Von Miller? Yeah, that's somebody you didn't mention. He's coming off of that, you know, injury that he had last year. I mean, how has he looked and what do you think he can give them at this point? Well, you know, with Von, that's been the big thing is, you know, what what type of Von Miller are the Broncos getting? Now, we didn't get to see that in 2020 because right before week one, leading up the final practice before the Tennessee Titans game, he has that season ending ankle injury and it just it deflated Broncos country. But for Von Uh, He got his first action back on the football field in the week three preseason finale against the L.A. Rams, and he looked good. He felt more confident and a little bit more comfortable. There was some concern a little bit about turf because his injury did happen on turf, so he didn't want his first game back to be on a turf field. So he played in that preseason week three game at home, obviously on uh, the grass stadium that the Broncos have there. Uh, As of right now, the expectation in Vic Fangio, the coaching staff, they've talked him up. They expect him to have a really strong year this year, and the hope is that both he and Bradley Chubb, opposite one another, can stay healthy. This is a big year for Von Miller. This is his final year of his contract, and the Broncos and George Payton, new general manager, they picked up his $18 million club option in the offseason, and they're going all in, and he has a chance. If he plays well and stays healthy, he can play himself into an extension, which could save the Broncos money and also give Von what he wants, and that's to retire as a Denver Bronco. You know, going back to the offense for a moment, you know, I, I – started to break down the the personnel. And if I had to pick an area where if I'm the Bronco fan, uh, I would be concerned with, and you guys tell me if I'm right or wrong on this, the right tackle spot, I think would probably make me a little nervous there. What can you tell us about how that's been playing out? I think Bobby Massey has been named at starting right tackle ahead of good old friend Cam Fleming, who was with the Giants last year. So how has that offensive line been uh been basically coming together with Bobby Massey there. Well, you touched a bit of a sore subject there with Cam Fleming, Patricia. I mean, he's, you know, he's a topic of discussion almost daily on this show, but uh, in all, you know, in all honesty, it, it's been interesting to say the least, quite the revolving door. I know that the graphics get made on ESPN and Sunday Night Football, the carousel the Broncos have at quarterback, but quite frankly, it's been way worse at the right tackle position. John Elway tried time and time again, whether it was free agents, draft picks, you know, trades, whatever. He tried anything and everything to get that position fixed. And they thought that they had it fixed with Jawan James, who obviously suffered a season ending injury out uh, outside the team facility in the off season. So he gets cut. You bring in Bobby Massey. They actually really had some high hopes for this guy, Calvin Anderson, a player who played three seasons at Rice and then one season at Texas in college. He's kind of just been stashed away on the roster until last year. We finally got a chance to see him play a couple of games, both 
at right and left tackle. And, and I thought he did a little bit better on the left side. It looked a little bit more natural there. He did get a fair, sh- uh, fair shake at it, though, in training camp. He was the first guy out there with the, with the starting offense, just like Drew Locke was at quarterback. So they let kind of these guys that were holdovers from last year get the first crack at reps. But Bobby Massey, obviously a, a former pro at the Chicago Bears, did a good enough job. And Vic Fangio said that up to this point, you know, he held off a pretty – a pretty uh, tough competitor in Calvin Anderson for that right tackle position. So definitely, you know, annually, it seems like a concern for the Denver Broncos and Broncos country. But as of right now, I think fans are feeling pretty good about where Bobby Massey's at, considering he did fairly well in preseason play. All right, final one for you guys. Let's talk about the defense. Now, I am absolutely fascinated by the job that the Broncos did in the offseason with beefing up that defensive secondary. I think it's probably one of the best at least on paper, you know, in the NFL right now. And I love that safety group. And Giant fans know that I'm very high on the Giant safety group. So, um, you know, that says a lot. That being said, where is the weak spot on that Broncos defense? Well, it's really tough to pinpoint one area, Patricia. You know, I, I would say that the Broncos, they they beefed up, obviously, at outside linebacker. They have five guys on the active roster and, and five serviceable guys at that. You know, when you factor in Bradley Chubb, Von Miller, Malik Reed, Jonathan Cooper, uh, you know, seventh-round pick out of Ohio State, and an undrafted rookie for agent out of uh, Vanderbilt and Andre Mintz, who made the roster. It's, it's crazy to think about the depth they have. Cornerback, you know, obviously a strength. Their safety, they've made that a strength. I would say right now the question is probably on the defensive line, not because of a lack of talent, but I'd say just due to the injury history that some players have had. Mike Purcell's coming off of a list Frank injury, which we know is a very complicated injury at that. He's been a big part of their defense, and when he went down last year, that was a big blow. I would say that you have some promise on that defensive line. The depth is good, I think, at every level of the Broncos' defense, but you do worry about if one guy does get injured. Uh, so I would say defensive line and linebacker too. I mean, it's a, they have a very underrated linebacker duo in Josie Jewell and Alexander Johnson. But in comparison to the rest of the defense, I'd probably say it's between those two positions as to where you probably have the more concern, uh, I think, overall if you're a Broncos fan. And I, of course, am concerned about the Giants offensive line, which continues to be a big, big question mark. Injuries. You know, Shane Lemieux, is he going to play the left guard? Is it going to be Nate Solder, who we think is going to be the uh, the right tackle? You guys, of course, familiar with Nate Solder, um, having played college ball out there in Colorado. Or is it going to be um, Matt Parrott? I think it's going to be Solder. So I'm very interested to see how that giant offensive line holds up against that Broncos defensive front. That is a very, very good test for this group coming right out of the gate. So... It's going to be a fun one. It's going to tell us a lot about where both teams are after, you know, we met making their rosters, their respective rosters. And it all comes down at MetLife Stadium, Sunday, 425 p.m. Eastern, 225 p.m. Mountain Time. Guys, I'm excited and uh, I'll be there. And uh, I know you guys will be following along and uh, there'll be plenty to talk about, I'm sure, after that game. Absolutely. Patricia, hey, thank you so much for your insight on the New York Giants. And here's to hoping that both teams come out of this game healthy and can, you know, obviously take the next step forward in their ambitions to win and compete inside their division. But thank you, as always, for this crossover episode. Always a treat, Patricia. Same here. Thank you so much, guys. And I'll drink to that about beats coming out healthy.